Well, why is our skin important? Well, obviously, if you think of it like this, our skin is like a barrier between our bodies and the outside world. It's kind of like a big shell over a, our turtle, if you will. It's the largest organ in your body, and I know that that used to be a question in Trivial Pursuit, so if you ever play that game, it'll give you a leg up. You, people always think liver, heart, or something, but no, it's the skin. It weighs about six pounds, but it really is the, the, the barrier between, you know, think of it, you know, a lot of you have heard maybe about staph infections and MRSA, uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Well, any crack in your skin can lead to an infection, and that can be very serious these days, whether it's bacterial infections, virus. Uh, it also plays a role in the immune system. It plays a role in preventing skin cancer. But the thing that's, uh, that we want to talk about today is really about skin cancer because it's really uh, a major problem. There are really three main types of skin cancer. And I don't want you to go away from this talk thing, boy, I've got to know the difference between a basal cell cancer or squamous cell cancer or a melanoma. We just want you to know some of the uh, main characteristics. But it's the most top common form of all cancers. And sometimes I think we get caught up in saying cancer when it's really cancers. There's over 100 different types of cancers, and a lot of them all act differently. So... When you find it, there isn't really finding a cure for cancer. There's find, it's find, trying to find a cure for individual or different types of cancers. But there are more cases of skin cancer in this country diagnosed than lung, colon, breast, and prostate combined. And the two most common ones are basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer. Carcinoma is a word for cancer. And you have the top layer of skin in your body is called the epidermis. And the basal layer of that top layer, those are the basal cells. So, if, so that's where basal cell cancer originates from. And then squamous cell, those, they're called squamous cells. So that's where, it, they both come from the top layer of skin. Both of these common skin cancers are uh, the vast majority of them are, are caused by sun damage. How much exposure that you've gotten to the sun. And the thing that you have to realize is that the damage that you do to your skin uh, from sun, or actually, let's, let's say from ultraviolet light. There are two, two sources of ultraviolet light. Natural, which is sun, and then artificial, which would be like tanning beds, which have exploded over the, in usage over the last 20 years. But the damage that you do to your skin from ultraviolet light is cumulative. It's over your whole lifetime. In fact, 80% of the, the amount of damage you do to your, your skin from ultraviolet light, 80% of that comes before, from, before you're 18 years old. And think about that. Why is that? Well, what do you do when you're a kid? Well, you're outside. Your parents told you to go outside. So you, it's just more, more at risk. But one in five of every Americans will develop a skin cancer. And when I first started giving this talk, as Lynn alluded to 20 years ago, it was about one in seven or eight people. Now it's one in five. Some people say it's getting closer to one in every four people. Be between these two cancers here, basal cell and squamous cell cancer, over a million cases in the United States diagnosed each year. The basal cell, common, basal cell carcinoma, and again, carcinoma is a word for cancer, is the most common type. And do we, do we have a pointer by chance? Or? Oh, that's okay. Anyway, where you'll see both of these cancers, the mo most commonly, are going to be the greatest areas of sun exposure. So it's going to be your head and neck, anywhere on your face, neck, ears, ar arms, and your hands, because those are the ones that are always out. The basal cell cancer, if, if you ever have to have a cancer in your lifetime, that's the one you want to get. Because it, it's, it's the most common and it's very slow growing. I have patients come in and say, oh, this spot's been here two, three years. Well, probably has been because it's that slow growing. And 
you, you can cure it with surgery. So what you do is you cut it out, and you send it into the lab, and you, you, you look at your margins. You look at, are the, when you look at it under the microscope, are the sides clear? Is the bottom of that specimen that you cut out, think of that specimen like a loaf of bread. They do slices of it, and then they look at these slices of bread or cross sections of the skin and make sure it's not touching any edge. If it's not, you know, you've got a pretty good chance that it's going to be cured. The squamous cell, and cell cancer, and again, most of them are going to be like little red bumps on the skin, a little growth that slowly gets larger. And oftentimes, they will become ulcerated or scabbed over because they don't get enough blood supply to them. And it's not uncommon that something will scab over, heal up, bleed, scab over again, heal up again. The squamous cell cancer is very common as well. The only thing that's a little bit different about squamous cell cancer versus basal cell cancer is that it can sometimes spread 5 to 10% of the time if you, if you weren't to catch it early. Basal cells are very slow growing. By and large, don't spread, but, but squamous cell cancer could. The other thing about squamous cell cancer that's important is that that's the, if you get a skin cancer of your mucous membranes, like on your lips, inside your mouth, that's the cancer it tends to be. So not only is sunlight a major risk factor, but uh, tobacco usage would be a major risk factor for squamous cell cancer, too. Another risk factor for both types of cancers are, or is uh, previous damage to your skin. So like a, a burn, you know, a chronic burn scar, or exposure to chemicals over years, especially arsenic, which is not around much anymore, fortunately. But radiation, you know, radiation is, is used to treat bad cells, but it can affect good cells. So uh, let's say you had, like, radiation for a thyroid cancer. Well, it killed the thyroid cancer, but it also damaged the good cells, so you'd be more at risk for these two types of cancers. But by and large, the treatment is surgery. You catch it early, you cut it out, look at it on the microscope, make sure you're all clear. And then occasionally, like I said, squamous cell cancer might spread, and then you might need chemotherapy or, again, radiation for that. But who gets these types of cancers? By and large, it's fair-complected people. Any people of, of any ethnicity can get a skin cancer, but those that are light-complected uh, have the greatest risk. So for instance, if you're a redhead, blonde, blue-eyed, you have a much greater risk. So if, think about it, if you're from, from Northern European, uh, origin, you know, Norway, Denmark, Germany, you have a greater risk than if you're of, of Italian extraction because you, you don't have as much pigment. You have, you have melanin or pigment in your skin. So when you go outside, you, you do tan somewhat. What's happening is the, the pigment cells in your skin are releasing pigment. And what the pigment does in your skin is it absorb, absorbs a lot of the sun's rays so it doesn't damage your skin cells. Well, think about a redhead or a blonde person doesn't have as much pigment, so they're, again, much more likely to get burnt, and, they're, and they're gonna get, their skin is going to get injured, which is going to increase your risk of getting a skin cancer someday. Now, sometimes, too, it may not always be a little red bump, especially with the basal cell. Sometimes it's just a little patch of scaly, dry looking skin. You might think it's an eczema or psoriasis, but if it doesn't go away, that might be a skin cancer as well. Now, melanoma is the least common of all skin cancers, but it's potentially the most deadly. Some, some lay people might call it a, a mole cancer, because Oftentimes, they, they arise from an existing mole, but they can also arise just from previously what seemed like normal skin, too. They don't have to arise from a mole. But it's estimated that there will be you know, close to 69,000 cases, new cases in 2009. So contrast that with basal cell and squamous cell, over a million cases, this is relatively rare. It's about 5% of all skin cancers. 
But when, again, when I gave this talk about 10 years ago, we were saying that there were about 39 or 40,000 new cases a year. So it's, it's increasing dramatically. It's, uh, in fact, I remember one uh, statistic from several years ago, I think it's between 85 and 95, the, the number of cases to be expected of melanoma in a year had doubled from the, over the previous 10 years, whereas the population of the United States only grew by 10%. So you couldn't explain it just by population alone. So again, it's a, it's a real, real problem. Again, it, it, most, it can spread to other parts of your body if you don't catch it in time. And it is the most serious type of skin cancer. Between 11 and 12,000 deaths each year. So it accounts for uh, most of the deaths of skin cancer from melanoma. And one in seven patients who get melanoma will be expected to die of their disease. And like I said, the risk is rising dramatically. So again, there's just, it shows you the 5% is the number of cases of melanoma each year. The non-melanoma cases make up the rest. But if you look, look at the deaths, again, squamous cell can spread to other parts of your body, could potentially be fatal. Certainly so can melanoma. So 70, three quarters of the cases of deaths from skin cancer can be due to melanoma. Yes, question? It's probably more from local spread and from, from the bloodstream carrying the, most likely the bloodstream carrying cells elsewhere, which is what you call metastasis or metastasize. No, you can't touch it here and spread it there. And another misconception is that, well, if you take a little piece of a melanoma without cutting the whole thing out, say if you were to do a biopsy, some patients come in and ask, is that going to make it spread? No. Another question. Is the cause for death because it's just not recognized for what it is, or, or the treatment modality is not? Um... The question is, 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 the, is the death because the treatment modalities aren't good enough, or is it not recognized? Well, probably both. If you don't, if you don't catch it early enough, as we'll sh show you later, you, melanomas are potentially all 100% curable if you catch them early. That, you know, but again, you've got to be able to recognize it. The patient does, the physician does. But if it does spread, well, then it's like any cancer. It keeps multiplying, multiplying. We do have treatments for it to keep it at bay, but there's no cure for it once it spreads elsewhere. This is a good slide here. Here's the, the bottom left is the, the lifetime, your uh, of individual person's lifetime risk of developing melanoma in the United States. In 1935, one in every 1,500 people could be expected to develop melanoma. In the year 2000, the risk was 1 in 74. Well, 2009, it's closer now to 1 in 60. So you can see that why we're saying that risk is rising dramatically. We say, well, why is that? Well, there's a lot of things speculated, uh, but I think a lot of it is our exposure to ultraviolet light. Think about it, in 1935, it was considered, well, if you worked outside and you were very, very tan, maybe you weren't of a higher socioeconomic class and that's what you had to do to make a living. The uh, upper crust of society thought it was, looked a lot better not to be tan and they, they weren't out. Well, think about it, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, what do we do? We take our vacation, we travel much more, we take our vacations to Hawaii, the Caribbean, Florida. We have tanning beds now. People, people are thinking that a tan looks healthy. It's not. So you know, it's just, it's just your, it's just your uh, habits have changed dramatically. Now you can argue about the ozone layer. I don't know about that. I mean, is it, is it decreasing? Is it making the sun more harmful? Don't, I, I don't know about that. Maybe it's a factor. Maybe not. So what does uh, a melanoma look like? This here is, is uh, it's kind of, sometimes it's hard, but 
this here is what, you, if you see the base of this, there's a little, um, there's a little light spot. It's kind of a little small area of pigment. Now you've got this big bump or growth coming out of it. That's raised. It's, a, it's like a bump, so it's raised. <coughs> and then this is something, if you look here, it's, what we're going to show you later in some slides, it's kind of, when you look at moles, whether they're normal or not, it's kind of the, the rule of A, B, C, and D. Well, A is asymmetry. We, the first one was the A, the asymmetry. You have this little uh, patch of pigment or mole with this bump or nodule coming out of it. This slide shows you two things. See how the border around the outside is very irregular? And then the other thing is the color here is very variable. There's, there's like red, white, dark brown, black, and even shades of blue. So it's a very, di very different colors versus a, a normal mole would be nice, one even color. Again, here, here's just a uh, shows you asymmetry. There's the underlying mole. There's the melanoma, the, the, the bump coming out of it. So, uh, And then see how dark it is. It's kind of a bluish black. Now remember also what I told you, the, where the most common sites of where you see your, your most common skin cancers, basal cell and squamous cell cancer. Greatest areas, you can, get, you can see it anywhere in the body, but the greatest areas of sun exposure. So head, neck, upper extremities. There's another one there that shows you a very dark and kind of uneven color. There's one on the finger. You can see that little dark spot. Is very, first of all, it's very black, and then it's got a, a bump coming out of it right there. The most common location for melan melanoma in men and women is the back. The second most common location for melanoma if you're a man is the, is the anterior part of your trunk, chest and back. The second most common location for melanoma in women, and some would argue it's the most common location, is the legs. Okay. Why is that? Well, okay, it's probably where you get these areas of limited but sometimes intense sun exposure. You may be in and out, in and out various times during the week, in the weekend, get a lot of sun on your face and arms, but maybe on the weekend or when you go on that vacation, you get a lot more sun on your back, your chest, and your legs, and oftentimes get a sunburn. Sometimes you, they can occur under fingernails. And so you'll see this darkness under a fingernail, and, see, and then you can see the pigment kind of leaching out onto the, what we call the nail fold or the finger there. So again, these can occur on any part of your body. Doctor, I have a question. Yes. Will that grow out and come in nice all the time? Or will it remain that way? What well, you... You'll end up. You'll end, the question is: Will will the will the cancer grow out? Well, you'll you'll end, you'll have to cut off the end of the finger. You'll lose you'll lose a good share of your finger if that's if that's if you get diagnosed with that. So it won't grow out by itself. No, and if you leave it, it'll obviously spread. Again, another person's finger. You can see that dark irregular spot. Again, a lot of times I'll, I'll ask patients, let's look at your feet while you're... Well, why would you want to look at my feet, doctor? I said, well, what's your feet covered by? Socks, shoes, and no, it's covered by skin. So, you know, you'd be, so you should look between your toes, look at the bottom of your feet. See that dark, dark thing there on the bottom of that patient's foot? The question is, how can that be? Because it's not sun exposure. Melanoma is not 100% related to just sun exposure. It, that's a large part of it, but it's also heredity, uh, how fair complected you are. I mean, if you're a redhead, 
your risk of getting a melanoma is seven times, seven times greater than a dark-haired person even before you step outside. If you're a blonde, it's three times the risk. Uh, but again, it's heredity. We usually say two or more first-degree relatives who have had a, a melanoma make that a very, very significant risk factor. There's also something called dysplastic nevus syndrome. Dysplastic means abnormal. Nevus is the medical word for mole. So there are some people that have abnormal moles that predispose them to those abnormal moles becoming malignant. Other risk factors are where you live. Well, the closer you are to sunny climates, the greater your risk. The greatest risk in this country is uh, Tucson, Arizona. The greatest risk in the world is, I think, Melbourne, Australia. But again, you think in Australia, the sun's very, very intense. Those people came from England, they're all tend to be fair complected. So no, I doubt this person ever burnt the bottom of his or her foot. And there's a pretty bad example of a person's foot, big, large, black thing. And that, that's, fortunately, you don't see that very often. But you know, in medical textbooks, sometimes they show you the, the worst pictures. Well, that would have been growing for a long time, right? That would have been growing for a long time, yes. But you'd be amazed how sometimes people don't, don't see things or in denial or don't want to go to the doctor. You know, might get told something bad. If they're not told it's something bad, then that probably isn't or it may not be bad. Okay, again, just uh, another example of a nod nodular lesion. This one's actually a little bit reddish on the surface. So some of them, they don't always look uh, black and uh, blue. That's got hair growing around, and I think that's on an arm. But it could be in a scalp. And that's the other thing. When you try, try to look at your body, I mean, it's, it's difficult to see in your scalp, you know. So I oftentimes tell women and men, too, I, if, if they've, they're predisposed to having skin cancers or they've had skin cancers before, tell your hairstylist or your barber, hey, look at, look at the skin of my head. And I've had a lot of patients sent to me because of... Uh, their bar barbers or hairstylists notice something. What's that old commercial? What was that from? Only your hairstylist knows for sure. <laughs> Alberto VO5. <laughs> and there's some someone's cheek. Um, now, and this this person probably had not my patient, but probably had this kind of dark spot here for a lot of years and ignored it. It was probably kind of a low-grade melanoma and then became much, much worse and you saw that black outgrowth there. Now, there's a patient with all these little black melanomas on the back. Now, there's, there's someone who's an example of local spread. That person's probably had a... It looks like this, the melanoma may have been removed there, and now it's spread locally to the other skin around. It's come back. So what happens with melanoma is they can first, I mean, they can do anything, but the first place they might go is to spread to the skin around it. Second place they might go is like other regional areas like, say, your lymph glands, and then they may spread to distant parts of your body, like your liver, lungs, brain. There's a, there's a back of someone's ear. See that very irregular dark area, top of the ear? Now, I, this slide just shows you, this is actually, a, I think the next couple slides are a couple of patients who've had the most common types of skin cancer. And I said those are slow growing. If you catch them early, you can cut them out. But if you let something go, sometimes they leave some pretty significant defects. And then you've got, a, like the one on the right, you're probably going to have to get a plastic surgeon involved there. There's the top of someone's forehead. That patient was actually 25 years old. So we've kind of talked about some of the risk factors, but environmental, you know, again, excess sun exposure. It said that, I always say greater than two or more, but this, the slide says three, but blistering sunburns during childhood, that doubles your risk of a melanoma. We've had a blistering sunburn. Sunburning is 
absolutely the worst thing that you can do to your skin. Absolutely the worst. Especially if you're young. At any age, but especially if you're young. Does that have to be, I mean, if you just got like your face sunburned, that would be where you worry the most. Then. Well, it would be any part of your body, but I'm talking, it, the greatest risk if you get a blistering, yeah. if yeah. you burn so bad it becomes blistered. But yeah. any burn, you think about, that's really injuring your skin. So the skin heals, but you still got some abnormal cells left there. The next thing says actinic keratosis. What that means, that, that's a term for a precancer, these little red scaly things. Another slide, I've got some little slides of that, but these little red scaly things that people get on their face and ears, and they, they have about a 10% chance of someday becoming a skin cancer. So if you have a lot of those, um, that pre makes you more at risk. Exposure to ultraviolet radiation we've talked about. But again, tanning beds, they've been around, there's nothing safe about them. They get touted as a safe way of, of getting a tan. It's not a safe tan. You've got to think about it. It's, it's a form of radiation, so it's harming your skin. Plus, people that go to tanning beds usually go outside, too. So they, it's like harming yourself in, in a lot of ways. Doctor? Yes. What? I mean, sun lamps? Well, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, yeah, I mean, you're talking about going to a tanning bed or getting some sort of, well, you can buy them, but, but you can buy those, but those are harmful. Now, what you're saying is, for what we tell people like that, they've got to have some color, go get the self-tanning cream. You know, there's been a lot in the press about getting vitamin D, I mean, your skin does generate vitamin D for your body when you get exposed to the sun. So a lot of people are saying, hey, let's go. we need to go outside to generate vitamin D because people are thinking if you, have it, uh, if you keep your vitamin D levels up, that's cancer-fighting uh, vitamin. Well, the problem with tanning beds, sun lamps, going outside for vitamin D is people tend to get too much. And again, you may read about vitamin D, you know, the, the position of the American Academy of Dermatology is that there's a lot of other sources for vitamin D, diet and, and supplemental vitamin D and calcium. If you go out, like, for just 10 minutes, a couple times a week, is that enough vitamin D? Uh, you're generating vitamin D, but is that enough? Well, it's not, it's, you can't, in this climate, you can't really do it in the winter. It may be enough two, three times a week if you live in a sunny climate. Again, hereditary, we talked about the fair complexion, especially if you're, Michelle? I'm sorry, can I interrupt? This is Mary Lynn. Yeah. Uh, if you're leaving upstairs, sorry. All right. Ready, fair complexion, moles. People that have a great number of moles, and this is kind of a subjective thing, it's not like 10 moles, 20 moles. The average person has 25 to 40 moles, believe it or not. But those that have an excess number, and when you see them, you know them, you know, that puts you at risk. And again, history of previous, any cancer, especially if you had melanoma before, that increases your risk. Well, it's like a lot of things. It's prevention and early detection when, it, when you come to talking about cancer. So what are you going to do to prevent melanoma? Well, if you can, stay in the shade. You know? But you have to be careful. Let's say if you're in a shade area next to a lake or concrete, or water or snow, there is sun that's reflected off that, so you still should be wearing sunblock and protective clothing. I have seen people, including a physician colleague of mine, that got burnt from sitting under an umbrella at the beach because didn't account no sunscreen didn't account for the reflected light. The other times you got to remember is that between oh ten and four, usually now it's daylight savings time. You know, eleven to around four, four thirty. The sun is most intense in the middle of the day. It's the sun is directly overhead, so the damage is, is, is the potential for damage is the greatest of that time. It might be 80 degrees at noon, and it may warm up to 95 degrees at, at, at uh, 5 o'clock, so it feels a lot more warm, but the greatest damage you're doing yourself in the middle of the day. So we oftentimes tell patients, we're not telling anybody not to go outside. It's not, it's not a fun way to live. It's not a realistic way to live. 
but if you have that golfing to do or yard work or swimming, do it early in the day or later in the day, especially for kids. I don't know how many t parents I ask, what time do they go to the pool? What time do you go? Oh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Well, that's really the worst time. You should go later in the day or have the kids read books, take naps in the middle of the day. Clothing, you know, and the darker the color of the uh, clothing, the better. The tighter the weave, like say if you have an old thin t-shirt that's been worn, well, sun can get, get through that, especially if it were to get wet. And there, there are, a, there's a lot of uh, companies now making clothing that is ultraviolet resistant. It has, even has its own protection factor of 15, 30, or 40. So nothing gets through it. They make hats, they make shirts, pants, and they have a lot of patients who even swim in that, and they say, and it's not hot at all, the long sleeve shirts. That's been a, really a great advance. And then sunscreen. Sunscreen is a chemical that you put on your skin, and what that it does, it's kind of like the color in your skin. It absorbs the sun's rays. So they all have SPF, which means sun protection factor, of, of numbers two all the way up. Now I just saw something the other day of 100. Well, that, what that means is how long you can be out in the sun before you, you burn. And that's usually in a, in a lab situation, but let's say if you knew you could be outside for 10 minutes before you might start to burn. Well, if you put on a sunscreen with SPF of six, well, six times 10, now you could be out an hour before you'd burn. So it increases the time you can be out. But what you have to read, so what we, what we as rec at dermatologists recommend, anything that's 15 or above. 30 is more effective than 15, 45 is more effective than 30, but as you get above 15, the, the increments of advantage are not that great. So 15 or above. And the other thing about sunscreen is you have to reapply it. Because again, that's a lab testing that, that number, so if you wipe it off, sweat it off, so if you're being very, very active, you need to wear something that's waterproof, sweat proof, and then reapply it frequently. Usually we say about every hour and a half or two hours if you're being very active, like cycling, running, uh, swimming. And there are studies that suggest that using sunscreens from the very early on in childhood, from six months up, all throughout childhood, decreases your risk of at least the most common skin cancers by 80%. It's not quite as clear with uh, melanoma. And there's, there's a lot of moisturizers now that are good for just daily usage. Like uh, a lot of companies make them and they've got sunscreen in them so they moisturize your skin and protect your skin. And that's perfect for like at a picnic or a ball game when you're not being real active or if you're running errands, you're in and out, accumulating a lot more sun than you might think you would be. Sunglasses are important, uh, especially those, and most of them say that they're UVA and UVB protective. There's two really wavelengths of light that you'll read about, A and B, and most your prescription sunglasses are protective. Your, uh, your real uh, well-known sunglasses like Oakley's, Ray-Ban, they all are protective as well. And the other thing that, you know, with too much sun, besides getting skin cancers on your eyelids and stuff, it does lead to the early formation of uh, cataracts. So again, the other thing is, you know, this says prevention, but it's, it's more getting into early detection. The skin is potentially all of it visible to all of us. You can't say that about the inside of your colon, your breast, stomach. I mean, there are things you go in there and look at, it, but it's fairly, it's somewhat invasive. So you can look at your own body. And so oftentimes we'll tell women, okay, hopefully you're doing a self-breast exam every month. Look at your whole body. Men can do it too. Spouses, significant others, family members can look at each other's backs. Sometimes people don't like the pressure of, oh, what if I miss something on my beloved wife or husband? Well, that's not the point. The point is you, if you get used to what something looks like, Maybe you have a feel for that, so if something changes, you might catch it sooner, or if something pops up that you didn't think was there, you didn't get it checked. So stand in front of a mirror, you know, look as best you can, 
Look under your arms. Look at the, look at the uh, you can use a mirror to see your back if you don't have a sig significant other or a spouse. You know, try to see behind your ears as much as your scalp as you can. Look between your toes, your feet, any, wherever you can. Again, this goes back to our A, B, C, Ds. A is for asymmetry, so the, this is more about moles, but if you have a, a mole, they should be flat with the skin, or if they're raised, they should be nice and smooth. The border around the outside should be smooth. Color, you like to see something that's one even color, preferably very light brown or flesh colored. D is for diameter. Usually they say that you, anything greater than the, head, the size of a head of a pencil eraser should cause, have cause for alarm. But I also use that for anything that grows or changes. What now, about those of us who have these things that grow all the time, the keratosis, I can't remember. But, you know, they're, they're flat and they're, sometimes you can peel them off and um, it's hard to know what you're dealing with. The question is what about these keratosis, these little dark things that some people call age spots? Uh, they're these, they're, they're, they're these kind of warty-like things, yes. and sometimes you can scratch them off or rub them off. That can be very, uh, it can be hard to know. Okay. The vast majority of them have no cancer potential at all, and, and they, we all get them as we get older. It's just a function of aging. We don't know why. But sometimes they can be very confusing, and that's where, you know, sometimes a baseline skin exam by a professional can help you recognize what those are, hopefully. E is for evolution. How, how do they change again? And we'll just go through these quick because we showed you some pictures. There's a nice smooth mole on the left. Uh, see there's a bump coming out of those. Regular borders, again, even color, smooth border. See how those are kind of regular, especially the one on the left that's kind of chopped up around the outside. Color, consistent versus variable, and dark brown, black, blue, shades of that. And something that's, those are all quite large on the right. This is just, this is just an example of how a mole changes. See how it's, as you go from left to right, it's a little bit subtle, but it's getting a little bit darker and irregular. So again, you want to prevent it rather than treat it. You know, again, if you catch melanomas early, you got a great chance of 100% uh, of cure. Uh, if they spread locally, it's about 98% chance. If they spread to other parts of your body, you got a, about a 15% chance of surviving it. Again, we talked about doing the regular skin exams. If you find something unusual or suspicious, see a physician, uh, either your physician or a specialist in skin, like a dermatologist. And this is Michelle's slide, I believe, that she got, was it from the Oprah show or Oprah magazine? Oprah magazine. Oprah magazine. The only real protection, there's a guy in armor where that's got an SPF of 1,000. <laughs> Nothing's getting through that. And then another good one, I've seen this before. Maybe the next time you'll try a little sunscreen, a little plump pig on the left and a piece of bacon on the, the right. Okay, that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. I hope I've been able to kind of give you a sense of the significance of skin cancer. Uh, also, what some of these three main types of skin cancers look like, what you should be suspicious of. And then also give you a, a sense of how to protect yourself from the sun and then also how to detect, detect things early.